Hey there! It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk number 41. Oh, you put 41. the one. All right, 40, 41. There, there you go. All right. Yeah, we've been doing this a while, but we got a ton of stuff to talk about tonight. We got some great questions from you guys and lots of stuff about what is it? Uh, about Twisted Wave. Twisted Wave and Mac OS. And New stuff. Yeah. And we're going to talk about preamps because George and I saw a fascinating video about that the other day, and we want to talk about that. So if you've got some tech questions, throw them in there. Hopefully we can get to them. But it's time for Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together... From the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. BS. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. All right. Well, contrary to rumor, you know... Nothing's burning here, but it is burning up in the mountains, and it's smoky around here in Southern California. But last week, it was like a four- or five-day preview of nuclear winter. Oh, man. I, I was out of town by some quirk, happened to be out of town when that was happening. And it, all the pictures I was seeing was, yeah, it was like Mordor. It was, yeah, it was like being back in Buffalo in December. It was like cloudy, but it wasn't overcast. It was smoke. Yeah. It was kind of weird. But at least my, my the cucumbers grew better because the sun wasn't beating down on them. Well, Go there's figure. silver lining. Silver lining to that, that you know that it. yeah exactly. Well, if you're joining us here on Tech Talk, it's because you want to know more about how to make sure your home voiceover studio sounds the way sounds what it's supposed to sound like. I was going to get there eventually, <laughs> uh, but if you want to know how to do it right. There's really only two guys that really understand this. Everybody else is an expert in one studio, their own. George and I have been doing this a long time. And we know what it takes to get your audio right. And as you'll find out as you listen to the show, it's not this great piece of equipment or that piece. It's not having a great piece of equipment means diddly squat if you don't know how to use it. Uh, so one of the things we do is we like to teach people how to properly use their equipment. George, you've worked with some of the best people in the business. How knowledgeable are they when, when it comes to knowing how to use their equipment and what have you had to teach them? I mean, a very small amount. I mean, the folks that come into this business that come from production, the other side of the glass, as they call it, yeah. you know, are obviously going to be more technical or maybe they come from radio. They at least learn how to the right side of the mic to speak into on that's the, right the ticket mic they're using <laughs> and they learn how to you know radio production hugely helpful but people that come from the acting background music background whatever it doesn't they're not necessarily going to know this these secrets and even people that have been in studios a lot don't know 
some of the quirks that we have to deal with with these little closet, small, compact studio spaces, especially in apartments. Yeah. So, so if you want, yes, yeah, exactly. So if you want to learn how to do it right, if you want experts to show you how to just make it so easy that all you have to do is know where to stand, make sure your mic's in the right place and hit record because all that other stuff's been taken care of by the guys that know how to do it. You can work with us. It's very simple. All you have to do is contact us. Like for instance, if you wanted to talk to George, where would you go? You would go to the cleverly named George the dot tech, uh, domain name and type that in. And then it will take you to a menu that says tech VO tech services with a tremendous amount of options. If it's a little overwhelming for you. You can always contact me, but chances are you want to start with a sound check or just get a home studio consult where I can answer the slew of questions you probably have right now and uh, get you off in the right direction and not overspending on things that you hear you might need, but may not. So that's a good way to start. Dan, yeah. how about yourself? You you can be found over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Here it is right there, homevoiceoverstudio.com. And, uh, you know, I George and I do a lot of the same stuff. We, you know, it's, it's fun to work with people one-on-one and, and really get them educated as to what it really requires to do this. And they're all... It's always great when I finish with somebody and you see the tension, this boulder lifted off of their shoulders. Oh, it's not. Oh, that's what it is. But you got to talk to somebody who knows what's going on. And if you've already built a home studio and you want to know how, if it's sounding right, if it sounds the way it's what it's supposed to sound like, you can submit a specimen to me in my specimen collection cup at the bottom of my homevoiceoverstudio.com. Uh, web page and uh, for $25 I'll be happy to analyze your audio and give you some tips and uh, make sure that you get it sounding right unless you need a lot of help in which case we can talk about that um, what's anyway. in your tech update this week my tech update I mean I was putting together some notes for the show and then it dawned on me boom don't bury the lead because twisted wave <laughs> has a new version wow so I'll talk about Twisted Wave. Go but for before it. that, because it's really the most important thing, is there are it's it's that time of year, it's that season, and Apple is pushing out all their new stuff, whether you're ready or they're ready or not, because <laughs> they they push the stuff out every year and it's not always ready. And I'll start with iOS 14. I haven't, I'm not running it because I'm avoiding it, but there is a new iOS. It's version 14. If you're on iPad or iPhone, your phone's probably already nagging you to update to it. Um, Dan, have you hit the button yet? Has it happened on you on your phone? Uh, there was one the other day I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like if, if, if it's an iOS update, it's just like, yeah, whatever. Fine. You know, the well, computer, I, I listen to so. you. It's like, is it time yet? Well, I used to see, <laughs> I used to think that was okay. But iOS 13 had numerous updates that were a big bomb. So I, I, I've been very careful, but um, iOS probably less or so, but the big one is Big Sur. That is the, that is what's coming out after Catalina. That's going to be, that's going to be Mac OS 11. Wow. No more 10.15 or that's not going to be 10.16. It's going to be 11. Um, is it a dramatic difference from Catalina under the hood? Probably not so much, but I'll say this every single year. Uh, don't update right away. Don't or don't upgrade right away. Uh, have a backup. Here's actually here's a checklist for you. Don't install if you aren't prepared and backed up. Don't install if you don't have a spare Mac to experiment with, or a plan with how to use uh you know install another version of OS. Don't install if you can't handle problems. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> don't install if you need specific apps that may not possibly run on Big Sur. That would be pro users. Um, don't install if you are working from home. Really? Pretty much don't install, I guess, is what that means. And um, don't install if you can't handle sound issues. Um, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, I think that's just, warning uh, enough right there. Yeah, this checklist isn't saying that all of these things are going to explode on you when you install it, but it's just being responsible. Uh, just, just because something is free and it's being offered to you, First one's free, man. Doesn't mean you should take it. So uh, give yourself some time and let, let us tell you when it feels safe. I'll tell you what, the safest version of OS is Catalina now. 
because now it is fully baked. It has gone through all of its updates and debuggings, and it is as stable as you can get. And that's really the one to be on. In fact, if you're thinking of buying a new Mac, now's the time to probably get a new Mac because it's going to have on it Catalina. It, of course, will be ready to run Big Sur when you decide you need to get it. But you want to be, you want to be not getting a new Mac after Big Sur comes out because then you'll be stuck with a brand new OS that who knows if it's going to run all your hardware and software. So just be careful about that. Do they, they, you, did you, they say when the release date is for that? It's usually like October-ish, mid, early to mid-October. Um, I haven't seen an exact release date yet, but it's coming pretty soon. So um, yeah, just be careful. Um, just be smart about it and, and avoid it if you can. Even if you mistakenly click yes and install it or download it, I, I mean to say, you don't have to finish installing it. You can quit installing it. So um, anyway, that's my spiel on that. You guys, you hear it every year. <laughs> um, but the cool thing I think is Twisted Wave 24. Now they've, they've if you're following along, they were version 1.23 point something for a long time. And now it's 24 because he's dropping the one point. So it's a cleaner name. So it's Twisted Wave 24. Um, New features, there's quite a lot, and uh, I'll, I'll read them down real quick. I haven't, I just installed it. I haven't had time to go through a bunch of tests and see if it has any bugs, but I do know Thomas, the developer, we know him, that he would not release something that he has not thoroughly tested, so it should be solid. But that said, um, maybe wait a little bit, just a week, maybe wait a week. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> Um, there's an, uh, he added in, believe it or not, a noise reduction. I saw uh, that. plug in effect. Um, it's really basic, like one slider basic. Um, and my initial test was, it, meh, <laughs> not great, but it's, he's trying. So good on you, Thomas. It's, it's there. Um, next would be the automatically detect glitches caused by missed buffers when recording. Ooh. This is really handy because if you're doing a long session, like a long narration, audiobook chapter, or whatever, if there's issues with your hardware during that recording, you're not going to know. Because one, you're either monitoring right off the headphones on the hardware, which won't reveal that, or two, you're not wearing headphones. You're, you're going you're to have no way of knowing. But this thing will mark little markers on the file saying, yo, right here, there was a glitch. Not saying you should stare at Twisted Wave when you're recording, but you can at least maybe glance at the screen once every minute or so and just see if it's marked some errors. Um, could be really helpful to save you a wasting a lot of time. Um, it shows an error now. Instead of falling back to the built-in microphone when you select when the wrong audio interface is not available. How many times have you hit record and it's recording from the built-in microphone? You know that the other one's plugged in. You you checked it earlier, but you restarted it and you forgot that you unplugged it and plugged it back. In. You know, whatever the case is, this should save you from a lot of embarrassment, especially the beginning of a Source Connect session or something where the wrong mic is plugged in or, or the wrong mic is set. This will rewarn you. Hey, you're not using the mic that you had set in preferences. You're using something else. Why do I sound so distant? <laughs> I I have, to, I have to say thank you for doing this, and I believe I was the one that got in his ear to put this in. So thanks, Thomas. Yeah, Appreciate that's, it. that's a that's a great feature. Um, added he also added an analyze action to the batch processor. So let me unpack what that means. Now, if you're doing mastering of a whole bunch of chapters, um, you can have analyze the analyze function be in a batch. So you can load in all your stuff so you can master. And at the end, it'll it'll process, say, 20 chapters. And then it puts out a file that will show you that your, your, anal your analysis of all the chapters is within the spec. So that means you're going to know by looking at this little spreadsheet, all of my chapters are in spec. Done. You don't have to go and you don't have to analyze each chapter one by one and check and make sure and change it if you need to. Very That's cool. awesome. And I... I'll take credit for that one too. I did I said I would love to be able to do that. This is, I think, the reason why 24 has been in the works for quite a long time. He was he was taking in a whole lot of suggestions for features and and trying to get them in there and then debugging and testing. So we waited quite a while for this version, but I'm glad he I'm glad he did it. Yeah. Um, I, you can I, now opt to automatically get beta versions of Twisted Wave 
and it will automatically update with beta versions. I don't recommend this, really. <laughs> you know, unless you're a tester or you've got another copy of Twisted Wave and you like bleeding edge stuff, don't don't run betas. <laughs> Not for your production studio. Um, when a punch and recording is initiated, while the selection is active, so if you have a dark section of audio, um, the contents of the selection will be replaced and then the recorder will stop when it reaches the end of the selection. So that makes that kind of gives you another version of punch and roll where you can choose a specific selection of audio to punch over and you don't have to worry about it recording over the next thing. Some people really need that to make it easier. So if you don't select anything, it'll just punch and roll on forever. But if you select something, it will punch and stop. Kind of, kind of handy. Um, I added the open recent document item in the file menu. So it'll show the last file you uh, that you're working on. Just a little thing, but a tweak. Um, let's see. There's a few others that are like kind of, you know, that's a big deal here. Um, the toolbar can be customized with a big version of the cursor position number, the number that shows where you are in the file in big, much bigger numbers. Some people really appreciate it. Well, yeah, it's in there yeah, somewhere. It's, it's easier to see uh, where you are in the, in the file. Um, let's see. Something about the lambda and quality parameters were swapped and didn't work as expected, and they changed pitch and speed effect. Funny, I last time I used it eons ago, I thought it was weird. That explains why. Um, when saving a file while recording, the document wouldn't be marked. This is an interesting one. The, the document wouldn't be marked as dirty, and you would not be offered to save it again after the recorder was stopped. So what does that mean by marked as dirty? When I read that, I was like, huh? Some kind of insider coding language for... You ever, you know, you record something and and when, and you haven't saved it in some programs, you'll see a little asterisk next to the name, or maybe it's in italics. Yep. Somehow it's marked to say, hey, you did something to the file, it's not saved. That's what he's talking about by the file is dirty. I had to do a little research on that, but I figured that out. Um, changes, I mentioned the way the file name, the, the versioning of the software has changed. Okay, now it's 24. Um, moving the cursor to the beginning or the end of the file um, when you move the cursor to the beginning or end of the file, the selection is discarded. So like if you selected something somewhere way back in the file, somewhere random, it'll stay and there. you jump to the end, yeah. you don't have to worry about it hitting record and jumping back to that thing again and recording over, which right. is, you know, these are little, these little tweaks can save you time over time and really make things easier. Um, so anyway, a couple little minor bug fixes, but really that's it. That's quite a laundry list. And I'm curious to find out from you guys in the comments below which of those features you found to be incredibly useful for you and which ones you're using. Yeah. So I find it fascinating. That this is a program that I don't think he was originally intending it for, for voice actors, but it has become a real no. standard for voice actors on Mac. Uh, you know, he was probably taking a lot of open source code to create a program and I guess it was Bo Weaver that noticed it and started using it. And now it's become, yeah, you know, and he's listening to voice actors and he understands his market. Somehow he got in the, somehow Bo got in his ear early on and, uh, and Thomas listened. So he was giving them, he was giving them feature ideas early that were voiceover centric. And, uh, you know, it's used by a lot of other people, people that are editing samples and doing a lot of different things, but he's listening to the voiceover community clearly by that list of updates. I mean, a lot of that stuff is highly helpful for voiceover. So well, he's kudos. clearly listening to you, which is. Well, that was amazing. Right? <laughs> Months or years will go by actually where we don't communicate for whatever reason, don't need to. Um, but recently he just came out of the, came out of the woodwork and he was like, you know, answering questions and saying, yeah, I should add that in. You know, I, I happen to know he's a family guy, so yeah. He got very busy with his family for a while, and now he's back in. So uh, he's here. The thing is, he's always been there fixing bugs, you know. Yeah. And that's been his priority. So I love that. All right. Um, other little things. Um, this is a hack, Dan. Have we ever have you ever done this, or did I ever? Did you ever see this before? What's that? Attaching your headphone adapter, zip tying it to the cord for the headphones that you use it with, so it's always there, and doing it in such a way that. There's enough tail here that you can do this and then plug it into the gear. No, I but now I this. will. It's... Yes, it is so <laughs> helpful. These damn things get lost all the time. 
I know a lot of you use the same headphones on the same gear day in, day out. You don't need to unplug and plug and have this. But for me, I am moving between systems and I love the same pair of headphones. So boom, easy, easy hack. Notice that it's zip tied on the reverse direction from the cord. So when you bend it over, it plugs in. So anyway, but you dig that. All right. So, uh, did that again. And then um, lastly, Isotope RX is out, uh, RX8. And from what I've done researching, reading, watching videos, it's just a few new bells and whistles on top of RX7. So yeah. I didn't see anything that was VO, major VO stuff for yeah. voice actors. So yeah. if you're already on RX7, I don't think you really should have any reason to upgrade to RX8. Maybe if you're on old, an old, old RX, maybe then you upgrade, but I don't see it. I didn't see anything. I mean, you guys know if you think I'm full of it. Yeah. Put a I, comment below. But I, I get a lot of I get a, a lot of emails, people asking questions, you know, about how do I use RX seven and it, and what we're seeing is a tremendous amount of RX seven abuse. Oh, man, uh, I hear it all the time. Yeah, it's like, like garbled it's, audio and yeah, muffled. It's not gonna save you. It, you know, it's not really designed for voiceover. And if you've got it, as we were saying earlier, if you don't know how to use it or why you would use it or how it does what it does and what it does, you really shouldn't use it. It's for fixing old vinyl records primarily. And yeah, or, it's, or rescuing um, an interview. production audio from right. a video or a film. And, you know, the producer has to do something to make the audio, audio usable. That's really what it's for. God forbid you put it in a template or a preset. Oh, God. <laughs> or a stack and you use it every single time by, by rote because you're... That's not the way. That's not the way to use those tools. Those yeah. algorithmic tools that change the audio fundamentally. Really, be careful about when you use them, and use them only when they're needed. Yeah, and the engineers know when you're using it. Oh, they sure do. I'm not happy. They know about it. the artifacts, the sounds, yeah. that the yeah. swishy, watery, muffled, <laughs> yeah. weird sounds of re of those reduction noise reduction tools. Right. Yeah, which sort of takes us to this. Other thing, you want you uh -huh. to talk about the ever-evolving and tightening requirements for home VO studios as dictated by game production companies, uh, because that's what they're hearing, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that we're seeing some of these requirements coming out. Yeah, the requirements will come out from very, very, I mean, arguably, extremely respected and talented uh, studio engineers and producers, you know, because these games are produced on a very, very high level of production value. I mean, and the budgets are huge on games. So, but I think what happens is um, um, these are getting sort of disseminated and passed around by agents and others are saying, well, if, if, if XYZ studio says, this is what we need, let's just make sure everybody does, has to, you know, does all this. And it can be really overwhelming. Like there's a lot of details that go in like, different the way you sound at different distances and uh making sure that you can sound as good as it sound perfect at extremely low levels and extremely loud levels and all these things that are really important to doing video game type work but aren't necessarily valid for a lot of other things so uh, take it for with a grain of salt if you do get one of those sheets sent to you and you're working with dan or i send it to us yeah so we can go over it with you and make sure yeah, you know what? They're right. This thing is really important, and they're going to call you on it if you don't do it. Or, you nope, know, you're good. Like, yeah, I know it says that, but you're fine. And da da da. We'll, we'll disseminate what's really important for you because it's overwhelming. And sometimes you see these details come out from these studios, these requirements or these demands sometimes. Right. The last one I saw, at least they were talking about acoustics a little bit. A lot of times yeah. we've been seeing, you know, them throwing out this like, you got to have this mic, you got to have this, but not a word about, well, you really should be in a place that's acoustically sterile and neutral. Uh, because if you have a great microphone and a, and a very powerful preamp, you know, and you're in your bathroom, it's going to show up. Mm -hmm. uh, because all this good equipment is going to reveal the issues you have in the space you have, That's, which is why I generally preach that most of these issues that we're trying to deal with are all mainly physical, that your physical space yeah. is the most important thing when you're recording, because you can have, you know, any good condensed studio condenser mic. If you're, if your environment is right, that's, what's really most important. And it, it's kind of perturbed me that these guys on the other side of the glass who live in these wonderful voiceover palaces, 
you know, if you're at home, it's not the equipment that they're sending out or the the requirements they're sending out that's going to make the audio good. It's the environment in which you record. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are more. You are seeing more of that. Like you know, needs to be free of echo or whatever. One of my clients accidentally discovered that the spring on his microphone arm was actually being heard. He's been working in that studio with that oh. mic and that mic arm and everything for years and years. <laughs> But that one producer picked up on it when he had when he had him do a shouted line, you know, something really loud. It reverberated the, the springs in his the arm. Spring like a Fender wow. guitar. Fascinating. Yeah, it actually it actually rang like a like a spring reverb in a guitar <laughs> from the '60s, and you know what? I was like, "Yep, you know what? Once in a blue moon, I have actually heard that." And I just had him put some uh, tape around the springs, and that yeah. that was that. You know, so, you can even zip tie them, but that was it. Yeah. So now we want to discuss something because you and I always get questions about this and people saying, I got a, I got a manly or I got a, I got this preamp or that preamp. The Avalon and, 737. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or just, or this focus, right. The, the brick or whatever. It really is. warms me up. Yeah. It's, it's, I want my voice to sound warm because as we know, we all talk to other human beings in conversation with something that's giving us harmonic distortion. Uh, so, so we, you, you shut, you sent me this video the other day from somebody from sound on sound and these guys are the experts on it. They're mega and, audio and music geeks. Right. Sound on sound. It's a British uh, publication and, uh, yeah, they're very respected. One of the, one of the few remaining all magazines in pro audio, I think. That's true. Um, so yeah, and, answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was very good. I mean, it, but it, it reinforced what was kind of nice to see it. You know, you know, Dan and I give all this advice, and sometimes it's nice to get a little reinforcement from the music business saying, you know what, actually what we're saying is is correct, and it pretty much reinforced what we've been saying. Things like, you know, do you need a preamp? Um, <laughs> well, here's the thing. is A preamp is this thing that any time you plug a mic in to another device has to have. Like, everything has a preamp circuit so what they're referring to in this case is a standalone piece of equipment an external called preamp. A preamp. yeah yeah a box a rack mounted thing or thing that fits in a little lunch box little you know these are the preamps we're talking about so you you need a preamp because you have to have one in your interface that the mic connects to but you don't need an external preamp and um what you do need is no distortion in your audio right and a properly set mic gain on your Scarlett 2i2, your Apollo, your audience, whatever it is, a properly set mic gain will capture audio without distortion. That's the main job of that preamp. And that's really what you care about. The thing that's funny is the more you spend on the preamp, the oftentimes the further you move away from that. Now that's not always true. There's a few preamps that are that are they're claim to fame is accuracy millennia grace there's some companies that are you know designed to be and how much do those cost you know thousand plus dollars right for one channel grace has a good one eight hundred dollar range but you still have to be able to connect that to the computer which means you need more gear you need an analog to digital converter you know how to have you have to know how to gain stage and match the levels between them so there's no again no noise no distortion anything you add essentially will add more distortion um almost always um and that's that's the the wrong thing to do and when you hear about preamps doing things like warming me up mm. um you know a tube having this harmonic distortion or you know a transformer having this cool sound that's whatever they don't do any of those things unless you run them at the edge of their performance so that would be like the input gain turned up hot enough where that distortion actually starts happening, but not so much that it sounds crappy. <laughs> and there's a small range where that actually happens. And as an actor, like for you to be worried about where the gain is set for that specific performance so that it gets that specific thing is crazy. It's crazy. Like how can you act and be in the character and also monitoring how much harmonic distortion your preamp is adding to your voice at the same time and keeping track of all that. It's just, it's, it's just not, doesn't make sense yeah. to do it. Yeah. So don't do it. <laughs> 
most of the preamp, most of the interfaces we work with, I mean, the Focusrites and the Steinbergs and the Yamahas, their preamps are excellent. And yeah, I mean, they have more than enough to drive any good studio condenser microphone. We did that USB interface shootout. Type and it in the uh, YouTube, VOBS USB interface shootout. One of the best sounding ones was a eight, no, 12, I never I say 12 year old Apogee <laughs> One. That's right. Again, not my favorite product on the planet, but sound quality sounded great. Amazing. Yeah. Super clean, soup, no distortion. It just, so, you know, we're, we've been doing these, they, they've been making these inexpensive, portable, compact interfaces that sound great for a really long time. So we, we, there, there's some interesting things coming. There's this, there's, or already out. There's the SSL, SSL2, yeah. <laughs> that's the name of it, interface that actually has a button that says 4K. And when you press that, it adds some stuff to the circuit. It makes it sound brighter. And maybe it adds some small amounts of distortion. So it sounds like a circuit from one of their old mixers from the 80s. That's a rarity. I mean, there are some gear where you can push a button. It'll change the sound of the preamp a little bit. So there are some experimentation going on in that air area. Yeah. Focusrite Scarlet 202, I think they have an air button. Which is same a loopback sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's, an, there's a button that says air. Um, it's changing the circuit to add something that wasn't there. That's distortion, essentially. Um, so anyway, you can experiment with it. But trust me, that's not what the producers want. They yeah. want it clean. Have fun. Also yeah. understand that all of this stuff, especially the preamps, none of it was designed for voiceover. They don't even think about voiceover when they're, they're sitting there in their corporate boardroom saying, well, should, you know, should we make oven mitts or... Um, or, yeah, or interfaces, no voiceover mic preamp. No, no, and and it's all designed for making music. Yeah, and we're just borrowing this technology to do what we do in a home studio, because remember, this stuff didn't even ex doing voiceover at home didn't exist twenty years ago. Right, and and now it's they've people are pushing a lot of this technology. None of it will make you a better voice actor if you can't read your way out of a paper bag. It ain't gonna help. Yeah, I mean, you heard David last week say he's like he was using the same USB mic for eight years, and and doing just fine with that mic, and then just this year decided it was time to invest in top of the line equipment. That is the right way to do it, folks. Yeah. You don't Stick buy great with... equipment to get work. You right. work to get great equipment. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you're like, okay, I'm stepping up to another level and I have to be ready right. to, uh, to play at this level. And I want to have the tools that's expected of me. Then you, you make that investment. Absolutely. So. All right. All right. Well, that's we have... long enough, right? Yeah, I, I think we've exhausted that for the time <laughs> being until next week. Uh, but we got lots of questions. People mailed in questions because we've been off for a couple of weeks and we're going to get to those and elucidate you on wonderful stuff right after this. You're watching, watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. 
Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Hey everybody, it's the time of the show where we get to talk about one of our long-running and great sponsors, Source Elements. The creators of Source Connect and a laundry list of actually other tools that are on their website. If you go to sourceelements.com, create your account, first of all, you got to have an account. Once you have that free account, start poking around on the website. Source Connect is, of course, the thing they're known for that allows you to work with all the best studios and producers in the world from your studio at home. But they have a lot of other interesting tools, including a meeting tool, which is, you know, if, if you're sick of Zoom for whatever reason, you just don't even like saying the word anymore. They've got a tool on there for free that will do what essentially Zoom does. Um, there's a, they, they have a lot of interesting solutions. But the thing you need to have at this point, if you're serious about voiceover and you know that you're going to be gunning for those bigger uh, bigger budget jobs very good chance they're using source connect to produce that so they want to record you real time and hear you as you sound right off the mic and so you got to have that ready and get it going by going to source-elements.com getting a 15-day free trial you don't have to buy it right now just get that trial going so you have all the the machinery in place and the systems dialed in and the ethernet plugged in and those things so you're ready to go when the session does pop up but anyway we appreciate uh, that su support now from source elements after several years of their support of the show thank you guys and we'll be right back to wrap up and tech talk right after this. before time began there was vobs.tv watch or else well, we got a ton of questions that you guys mailed in, and we really appreciate that. And the first one is from Alan Propolis. Should I read it? Uh, you can. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, love the shows and your priceless wisdom every week. I've learned so much. Thanks to hear that. Great to hear that. I am looking at getting a vocal booth. I live in the UK, and there are several choices I have heard of, including Studio Bricks, Whisper Room. Cube, Cube, Esmano, and Dembox. The last three I've never heard of, actually. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, it's not easy to go, go and test them. And there's also not many I can demo before purchase. In your vast experience of booth tuning, were there any booth manufacturers that were you're most impressed with in terms of acoustics for voiceover? Would you say the Whisper Room with the acoustic tuning package is ideal for the small booth or maybe the Studio Bricks VO Edition? He's like, I'm not that concerned about the noise reduction as my environment is quite quiet and any booth should be enough to eliminate additional noise. I'm looking at something around four by six feet, TLM 103 into a SPL Crimson interface. I'm sure it's all subjective to each type of voice, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, Boy, there's okay, a lot well, there. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm glad he, I read on because he said, I'm not really interested in buying this to reduce noise. Then why are you buying, buying a booth? <laughs> because they're so damn expensive. And anytime you take a space and shrink it into a small box, you create new acoustical problems that you have to now fix. None of these booths, and I say none of them that I've ever seen, sound good out of the box at any price. Yeah. The Whisper Room with the acoustic tuning package, nope pretty good but nope the uh the studio bricks vo edition damn close it's getting better i mean they seem to making little tweaks it's pretty damn good now still not right on the money all of these things have quirks the other brands again i don't know them as well so i don't know what they come yeah. with but i haven't seen a single voiceover booth company make perfect a perfectly acoustically tuned booth for voiceover 
because yeah. they were never designed for voiceover. They were designed to prove. So somebody who plays a saxophone or a violin or something can isolate themselves from other people and then they can't hear them on the outside. So you're dealing with acoustics in a small space that, you know, and the other fascinating thing is, is the louder you talk, yes, the more the acoustics of that particular booth come into play. That's and people right. tend That's to be over projecting a whole lot because they see a microphone, therefore they have to talk louder. And unless you're doing animation or gaming or something like that, where you really have to be louder, use your indoor voice and, and, in a in a big booth is not going to, you know, big expensive booth is is going to cause you more problems than it's going to solve if you live in a quiet neighborhood. Even the aptly named vocalbooth.com booth doesn't sound great without a proper acoustic tuning, ironically enough. So believe me, we've worked with them all and all of them need help. So yeah. uh, whatever you end up doing, don't overbuy. Um, the acoustics can be tuned pretty easily. So don't buy it. Don't focus everything on that. Focus, if you're really going to buy one, make sure it has a good door, quiet ventilation. Quiet ventilation. Works. Yeah. That's also rare to find <laughs> ventilation in one of these rooms that's quiet enough to run while you're in there. So yeah. that's what you got to be probably paying more attention to. Absolutely. Uh, Matt. Cork. Oh, wait a minute. Did I miss one? You missed it. Oh, Matt, Matt, my, uh, Matt, Matt Gilchek. Oh, uh, let's see. I've been using the caster plate under my whisper room for a few years, but I'll be moving soon. Well, isn't that convenient? Yeah. Caster plate for mm -hmm. moving your booth. Um, so I'm reevaluating uh, whether or not I should use it. I like the caster plate for mobility, but I'm curious if it would benefit the acoustics to remove it when I relocate. It's a five by five whisper room um, that was tuned by George. Oh, good. Um, and I will be sitting on a concrete slab foundation with carpet and padding in between. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep it short. Leave the caster plate on. It's it's better that the booth be standing on its tippy toes on little points of contact so that low, low frequency noise can't transmit into the floor than having the entire floor sitting flat on a slab. I don't know. I don't know if it make a difference on a concrete slab. Do you think it would, Dan? Maybe not. Uh, well, like you said, point of contact, uh, you know, a concrete, concrete slabs are great because sound really doesn't come up through them. Yeah, uh, very, I mean, it's unless a tank goes by or earthquake you know. sound. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we had a dandy here the other day. Oh yes, we did. You felt it better than we did. I'm sure. Oh yeah. I felt it coming and it's like, uh, I heard it coming. I was yeah. quiet. I was sitting in my sofa and I heard that. That oh, distinct oh, freight you, train you, rumble. And I'm you like, oh, you feel it coming and it's like. Is it going to be bad? And you're like, and right. then the chandelier started to swing a little bit. And it's like, okay, we'll be okay. I'll you got the, the swing and chandelier going? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whew. Yeah. So I I don't think it will practically make a difference to you. So if, you, if having the wheels on makes it annoying for you to use or whatever, you're probably okay. But, man, it's a pain in the neck to put them under there once it's built. So... I don't know. I'd leave it on. I would leave it on. Yeah. Well, it makes it easier to move anyway. So clean behind it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> here's one from our buddy Moose. 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 He says, I was watching the guy from Acoustic Fields talk about mineral wool insulation and how there's some health risks with using stuff like rock wool for helping build a sound booth. You guys hear any danger health risk with this type of batting? Well, yeah, it's rock wool. <laughs> You know, uh, it's it's like fiberglass. If you're going to work with it, wear gloves. I I have a flight suit that I use, you know, and mm -hmm. so I, because if I don't, Tyvek. it gets on your arms, it itches. Yeah, it's annoying. Yeah, but. It, it, yeah, it get, you're getting your lungs. That's probably the worst. Um, It's theoretically not as toxic, I guess, as the, the fiberglass, because it doesn't apparently have the formaldehyde or something like that. But it is still something that's going to float into the air, and you don't want it. You don't want it exposed in any way. You don't want it open in any way. You want to make sure whatever you're making is sealed completely, right? Unwrapped in fabric, because yeah, if partic particulates get out, it can annoy you or really irritate you. Um, one of my clients had a real problem with hers, and we had to 
we I had to revamp, uh, take all that stuff out and go with. I think we went to a cotton batting instead, and uh, to get rid of that yeah. uh, that irritation. So just be, yeah, double check. But it's it's definitely better than maybe the V the seven hundred three OC seven hundred three stuff, but it's still not not uh, not without its issues. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I work with Rockwell, like if I'm, say, making clouds or something along those lines, use a very heavy cloth covering on it. And then I covered the mm-hmm. back with, uh, uh, with weed, uh, anti-weed material, mm-hmm. which worked really well. Oh, that's good. Which is why it that's sounds so damn good in here. Yeah, and it's, that stuff's <laughs> cheap. You can put it all over the back and it doesn't, oh, know, yeah, it's cheap. Cool. Um, Patricia Corkum. Patricia Corkum. Hello. Checking in from the metro Boston, Massachusetts area. Thanks so much for gathering all this marvelous voice talent in one spot this evening. I'm really enjoying hearing everything, and I hear a few questions. Here's a few questions if I, if there is time. Well, there's um, time, and near now yes, on. Yes, there is. <laughs> you are in the right place at the right time. Um, uh, can you give a few refresher steps to correctly set or control gain in Audacity? I work with a Focusrite mixer, maybe a Scarlet, I'm assuming. And a Blue Spark mic. I currently work with Audacity, but I'm curious about other softwares like Audition. Um, and for pay to play, uh, this is a multi part question. All right, let's get to the first one. Right. Dan, is there any difference between setting gain on your mic between Audacity, Audition, or anything else? Not really, because you, you don't generally rely on the software for setting your levels. Uh, I always think, you know, just set it at a hundred percent and then save your, you know, set the level from the interface. That's the only place. Uh, if sometimes people are like, well, my levels are low. It's not because of the software, unless they've taken the, uh, the input and have turned it down. Like you can do an audacity. Uh, but what you do is you, the way you set the levels is, is you talk into the mic and you look at the VU meter. I think that's the problem is people don't understand how to use the meter. And there's a really good meter in, in uh, audacity and there is in audition and there is in twisted wave. And you want to be peaking at a certain level initially. And that's set from your interface and from the preamp on your interface so that you're consistently modulating to at least minus nine and peaking somewhere between minus six and minus four, according to the standards that, that we've really established. If you're not getting that, there's nothing you can do in the software uh, to adjust that, except maybe in post if you normalize it. And if you're recording, you know, at a high enough resolution to where you're not going to get a lot of extra noise when you, when you raise the gain. But primarily the only place you really set the gain is from the preamp slash interface. That's the thing that's always kind of irked me about Audacity is that it has that gain slider control. And I think that really can can Shut it to 100% and forget about problems. it. Yeah, like I think there was old, old issues with Windows where if you turned it up to 100, it was adding gain, like a lot, a lot, a lot of gain. Right. And it was really screwing people up. And then we found there was this weird like sweet spot of like 10% or something weird. But I think that's gone. That's gone. That yeah. problem's long gone. So, yeah, I think if you set it at 100, you should be fine. And, and any other software that doesn't have that control, you're just going to set it from your your mic preamp gain knob. Yeah. Um, and the last question is for play to play. What length MP3 file do you believe is most acceptable for most client situations since it all takes editing time? 25 seconds? 30 seconds? That's a weird question because I don't, isn't that going to be dictated by the script? It's going to be dictated by the script. The thing is, is if you don't impress them in the first five seconds, the last 25 ain't going to make a difference. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess if, she's it's maybe she's referring to, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong. Do you, if you're doing an audition from a script, you don't read the whole script, right? Well, it depends. Is that, Sometimes is that what she's asking if, if I get stuff from a certain agent in Austin who knows who he is, uh, who says, yeah, they want you to read the whole script. And when he says that, you do that. Otherwise, it's yeah. like, yeah, I mean, if they give you the whole script, yeah, you do 15, 20 seconds of it. Uh, unless there's different sections, you have to analyze each one individually. What is it they're looking for? 
Are they looking to see how you change pace? Are they looking to see how you would, uh, you know, are you going to read it in a certain way or are you going to give it several different takes? I, yeah. The thing is, is you want to be able to get their attention right off the bat by doing it the way they want. The thing is, is who knows what that is? Because they'll say one thing and then, you know, you always hear people saying, well, I, I auditioned and they said they wanted this. And then I see the, I hear the commercial on the radio or see it on TV. Uh, that's not what they asked for. Right. So it's, it, you know, if you're a good voice actor, it comes across, I think, is more yeah. important than anything else. All right. Well, Dan, there are 11 questions in the queue. Wow. Should we do a rapid fire round? It's time for or a lightning round. Ding, 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 ding. Should we try? Should we try a lightning round? All right. Let's go for it. If there's one that needs more attention, we'll we'll move it. We'll move it to another show. Maybe. Right. But we'll. All right. So rapid fire round. Starting with Shelly Raffle. Gain on the ID4 mic uh, interface. My issue is that the gain settings are different each time I record, which is confusing and problematic for long recordings that span multiple sessions. Also, when recording the wave patterns on my DAW, Audacity looked like little pebbles. Yes, I adjusted the mic volume there too. Uh, I want to make sure that my ID4 is functioning properly. I don't know what that's about. Like, I know the gain setting is t very touchy. Yeah. So just a small amount could make a big difference. Maybe that's it. what's happening, but yeah. I don't know. That one's well. Here, here's would... here's how I tell when I get that one. I, there are there are a couple of things I immediately think of. One, what microphone do you have? Does it have a 10 dB pad on it? Make sure yeah. the 10 dB pad is off. Yeah, the other no the other one on. is, are you talking into the right side of the mic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, makes makes a difference. It really. Yeah, does. if you, if your mic technique isn't consistent, then you're gonna that's think gonna make a difference. Inconsistent about your imp your gain. Yeah, because if your mic placement isn't exactly the same each time, your levels won't match. Right. So yeah, but is the ID four functioning correctly? Maybe it is. Know. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. You might want to hire one of us. We'll yeah. help you help you through that. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Clements, uh, when do you know it's time to upgrade your gear? I guess we kind of. Touched. We that was a good one that we kind of mentioned with in context of David. Yeah, last week. Yeah, from last week, he was using his I've had forever USB mic. He was using a Shure PG forty two. Right. Used it year after year, and he knew it was time to upgrade when he was getting requests to play at a, a bigger game, up his studio at home, be ready to do big time productions that require higher end gear. Oftentimes, that's that's how he knew. Yeah. If you don't know for sure, Nicholas, maybe you're not ready. Again, we can consult with you and, and listen to what you're already doing. So we can tell you whether you're 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 already hitting a hundred percent, no need to upgrade, or whether it's time because of a deficiency in your quality. But otherwise it's because you want to have more expensive gear and a better brand name and you know you're trying to impress somebody. All right. All right. Uh, uh, another one from Nicholas. Yeah. What makes an XLR mic better than a USB mic? Just about everything. Uh, Pretty much. Yeah, the problem with the USB mics is that the preamps in them, because they're a preamp interface shoved into a microphone, they sometimes are don't have the best preamps in them, and that causes hissing and a number of other problems with them. When you have an XLR mic, you're going to have an external preamp interface that you have much more control over. A lot of times the USB mics, you can only control them from, you know, either software or from, from your, your operating system. Yeah, I mean, one, one rare exception to that actually is the aforementioned PG-42. That actually has a gain dial on it, but most of them don't have a gain control on them, so you can't really properly control them. Right. Something, the Epigee mic, by the way, is a very good USB mic. It does. And it has I, I, actually, I, David, <laughs> David's, in the, David's hanging out tonight watching us. He's holding up his mic and showing, look, 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 see my PG-42? It has a gain knob. Yeah. <laughs> Great microphone. Yeah. I think Sue's, Sue, start, 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 if you, there we go. There's the back of the mic. It has a mix level control, a headphone level control, and an actual mic gain dial on it. Most of these USB mics don't have that except this one and the Apogee do. There you go. It looks oh, like right. a spaceship. All right. I think we got especially with that lighting. Yeah. I think we got time for one, maybe two questions here. Uh should we uh, get one from let's see, distortion. 
And then, uh, <laughs> all these questions come in. We don't have a chance here. Um, Jay Harris Black says, I've upgraded to iOS 14, and it's smooth on my iPad Pro and iPhone 11 Pro. Good. Fabulous. Um, uh, clo- Larry says, can we get a close-up of a zip tie? All right, show, again, him, show him the zip tie. No, he's got it. There it is. There's the zip tie with the the plug on. Nothing to it. Okay. Everybody's got zip ties sitting around. Okay. All right. Uh oh, well, J. Horace Black. Does the distortion you mentioned where one adds a preamp apply to a plug-in when using a universal Don't use the plugins for crying out loud. <laughs> That's The plugins are not for voiceover. And people keep telling you that you know, get the Apollo Twin because you can use these plugins are feeding you something that will drive you insane. Uh, yeah, unless you're a producer making those creative judgment calls and producing something, don't don't go there. I mean, really, they cause they, they cause so much confusion, gain staging problems, on and on. It's just now it's all in a virtual environment instead of actual gear, but it still can be very confusing yeah. as to even where to set the gain. That UA610B preamp drives me nuts because now the gain knob on your Apollo, all it does is switch the gain between five settings. Minus 10, 5, 0, plus 5, plus 10. That's it. The knob, that's all it does. It's just ugh, really annoying. Don't, don't, don't do it. You can't avoid it. It's amazing um, how much misinformation is out there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, okay, Jeff Holman. Our own, well, let's, let's close it on Jeff. Okay. Our own chat room moderator. Give him a solid. All right. Does my Sennheiser 416 take, uh, does it take a lot, or should I say, does a Sennheiser 416 take a lot of gain to power? No. I'm having to set my Scarlet Solo to 8 out of 10 or higher for my Sennheiser shotgun mic to pick me up at a normal level when I'm about 5 inches from the diaphragm. There may be something wrong with it. Probably not. Maybe there is something wrong with it. Well, it's... I tend to think that, you know, it depends on what he's recording on. If we were just talking about Audacity, he may have the Audacity slider over and it's not getting enough or something. Well, I know he's using Twisted Wave. Yeah. So he's on a Mac and I know he's got another mic that's similar. Yeah. Test the uh, other mic. If it's working better then yeah, it might be the mic. Could, it could be the mic. Uh, And make sure it's a real Sennheiser 416, Jeff. It could be. Um, if you bought it brand new for about 500 bucks, it ain't a real it's thing. It's not a real 416. Exactly. Uh, yeah, because that's ha- that was a, there was a while there was some there was some uh, counterfeits going around. Absolutely. And they sounded cruddy and they were weak. All right. So watch out. Yeah. Watch out. Yeah. So is that enough for you guys this week? <laughs> Probably not. But that's all the time <laughs> we have this week. So, uh, but we'll be back in two weeks with more tech talk. So send in your questions. To the guys at VOBS.TV. There it is, right there. Good timing, Sue. All right. The guys at VOBS TV, you have a question, send it to us. We'll be happy to answer it here on VoiceOver Body Shop. And uh, we'll be right back after these important messages. So don't go away. Before Before time began, there was VOBS.TV. Watch or else. Getting into VO is quite an accomplishment. And accomplishing anything in the world of performance can be really tough. Getting great information is tough. Getting the right advice and mentoring is tough. Simply getting ahead is tough. And the best way to get ahead is to simply get started. Let's make it simple. To get started in voiceover, the best way is with VO Hero's free online course, Getting Started in VoiceOver. You'll learn everything you need to know to create a successful, satisfying, and profitable voiceover career. The link is really simple. Here it is. VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Again, that's VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Get ahead in voiceover simply by getting started. Go to VOHeroes.com forward slash start. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. 
you have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. And we're back to say goodbye because we gotta go. But we do have a lot of people that help us out getting this show done. And most importantly, aside from our sponsors, there's you guys. And you donate to the show and because you want to keep it going, and we really appreciate it. And who are our donors this particular week, Mr. Woodham? I get to read them? All right. Yeah. Uh, Larry Hudson. <laughs> hey, Larry. Uh, Natasha Marchevka, Thomas Pinto, Trey Mosley, Philip Sapir, Christopher Epperson, Michelle Blenker, Antland Productions, Graham Spicer, Michael Kearns, 949 Designs, Shanna Pennington Baird, or Shauna. Shana. Shana. <laughs> Shauna. Shana. Shauna. Shana. Whatever. <laughs> Stephanie Sutherland, Teresa Daniel, Patty Givens, and George. With him senior. All right. All right. And, well, we'd like to thank our sponsors because they're the ones that make it happen. Uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All right. Thanks to Jeff Holman, who, boy, there were a lot of questions tonight. Yeah, Jeff. Thanks. We love it when you're, you're those come in. Uh, Sue Merlino for getting it done tonight and in post. And... Uh, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Uh, well, guys, you know, this ain't an easy business. But as George and I like to say, you know, if it sounds good, it is good. And that's pretty much it. You guys have yourself a great week. We'll have another great guest at that time. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B.S. Take care.